episode of Life Below Zero. Every day is a struggle to survive in the most remote corners of the Arctic. We're not at the end of the road. We're 300 miles away from the end of the road. Alaskans battle to overcome extreme isolation. There's no 911 out here. There's nobody to come save your ass. In life-threatening cold. This environment is not the climate the human body is adapted to. When you carve out a life miles from nowhere. The only thing you can rely on out here is yourself and your skills. Only the tough survive, man. Self-reliance is key to an independent life in the bush. Landscape in Alaska is vast. A place of merciless terrain, extreme isolation, and scarce resources. Relying on yourself to source food is critical to survival. But in hungry country, this is no easy task. Kavik River Camp is 197 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Sue Akins, its sole caretaker, is isolated within a massive tundra. Hundreds of miles from the nearest store, she must rely only on herself to stock enough meat. I don't disrespect anybody who goes to the local grocery store, but my grocery store is out in the wild in about a million acres. When I go out there, there's no telling what's going to be on sale. The Sue is on the hunt for caribou, but in the wide open field of the tundra, she has to get close and stay hidden or lose her shot. Look, of the six that are there, you can only see one and a half. If you can't see them, they can't see you. So I'm trying to use the topography of the area in my favor. But as you see, it's not like I have a forest to hide behind. So I have to use what nature gives me. Sometimes the poor elevation change. Dirty, rotten, prick bastards. They know something's up there. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Let's go see what I got. All right, little caribou. Well, I got him. This animal gave up its life so that I, you know, can eat this winter. Time to get him done, though. I'm gonna walk back here and uh, get the four-wheeler, get my knives, get them set up, cut them up, get them in the bag, get them cooled down. Yeah, I could have hung out and tried to get the other little dudes, but uh, let's take care of what I got first, get that taken care of, and then see what else is out there. Winter's gonna come in with a roar, and I need to be ready for that. 14 miles downriver from Eagle, Alaska, Andy Bassage and Kate Rourke Bassage have created a wilderness paradise along the Yukon River. But to sustain their team of 25 sled dogs, they need to pull thousands of salmon from the river using an ancient form of fishing. It's kind of an automatic fishing machine. It's relentless. There's no motors. It's all by the power of the river. I could stick this fish wheel in and I'll catch 500 fish a day. It's day on the Yukon, second day of fishing, and uh, it's not a very pleasant day to be cutting fish. It's not a very good day for drying fish, but it's a day that has to be done. Looks like the boxes are overflowing. Fish are flopping out. <laughs> Welcome to my world. The fish wheels are really wet all the time because of the splashing. The snow is very wet and very slippery, so I've got to be extra careful today walking around on the wheel. When you're by yourself, you can't take chances, and uh, there's nobody out there to help me if I fall in or smack my head. There's no 911 out here. So how's this for putting fish on ice right out of the water, huh? <laughs> 
The Seattle fish market's got nothing on me. I'm totally self-taught. I've never gone to school for anything. I've never really had any close mentors to teach me things. I just kind of figure it out as I go. You kind of become a jack of all trades living this lifestyle, but I enjoy that. I love inventing things. This lifestyle allows me to do that pretty much uncumbered by anybody or any other thing. It's a very satisfying way of living for me. So there's uh, 360 fish in the boat. Probably about 400, 450 fish by the end of the day. So that'll be a good start. Six hundred miles south of the Arctic Circle, on Kodiak Island, subsistence hunter Eric Salatan is on a quest to stock enough meat for the winter. He relies on years of hunting experience to find the meat he needs to survive the brutal months ahead. Here in Kodiak Island, sitting on the side of a mountain in a 40 mile an hour wind, sound cubs feeding on the tundra down below us. What can go wrong? Life is good. I'm gonna bite my lip and see if I can't grind out another thousand vertical feet. We've climbed more than two thirds of the way up. It's been a good haul. Just hoping the goats are still there when I get there. There's a half a decent one. Gus, I gotta get down right against the ground or I'll get knocked over. Basically just got my butt kicked on top of a mountain. It's blowing pretty good. It's really gonna limit how far I can shoot. When it's blowing 40 miles an hour like this, it'll start to push your bullets. shot myself personally. Pretty awesome. Taking the back strap off here. Tasty tender piece. We took all the edible meat of the goat here. I'm loading it up into this game bag. I kept the meat on the bone, which keeps it in much better condition. Made my pack to be about 100 pounds with meat and hide and the skull. Now we got to get back to camp in one piece. High in the Brooks Range, 200 miles from the nearest town and 60 miles from the nearest road, Glenn Villeneuve lives an isolated and primitive existence. In order to survive solely off the land, he utilizes every bit of the animals he hunts. A lot of my energy goes into getting food out here. And not only getting the food, but preserving the food, preparing the food, eating the food. We're gonna take a couple of these heads and get them thawing out so we can skin them and eat them. There's a lot of good food inside the head of a caribou or inside the head of any animal. When you're eating mostly animals for food and not too much in the way of plants, you need to eat as much fat as you can find, usually, or you'll get really sick. There's the eyeball right there, and right behind that eye, there's going to be a nice chunk of fat. And then you can start to pull out some of that eye fat. That's, that right there is just delicious fat. Mm. That's really delicious fat. And I'm also going to take the brain out and fry the brain. I just happen to like brains fried best. There, right through the brain. Boil up the eyeballs. And the brains I just scoop out. They probably look like scrambled eggs to a lot of people. It's pretty powerful food. You, you eat this stuff and you got energy to run these mountains and look for more of this food. 
If I was eating store-bought food, I don't know if I'd be able to get around these mountains the way I do. Norfolk, Alaska is a remote village 19 miles north of the Arctic Circle and home to Chip and Agnes Hailstone. Well, I guess we're going to go fishing again today. The fish weren't biting yesterday, but, um, you know, that's fishing, so we're going to give it another try. We can get a sled load. We might get nothing. We won't know if we don't try, so we're off. During winter, they are completely isolated and must travel the frozen Arctic waterways in order to find enough food. their holes where people have been lucky then we're lucky we don't have to dig so deep the fish move you know like this could be the hottest hole that there is for a whole day and tomorrow there'd be nothing at all in the same manner the holes it didn't produce today might just be the hottest places to be tomorrow so we don't know until we try just keep trying oh there we go there we go oh thick dolly Sheepish. And then we got ourselves uh, four smaller ones, and we got ourselves a couple of small TikTolic. And um, if you had to go buy the equivalent in the store, it'd probably run you three or four hundred bucks. So um, coming out here and doing this is uh, definitely worth our time and our effort. And we actually save money by buying gas instead of food at the store. Well, that's quite a few meals right there, all right? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. We're going to jump on our snow machines, and we're going to head off to Norvik and have ourselves a nice little trip home with some smiles on our faces. <laughs> Self-reliance in the Arctic requires ingenuity. With limited resources, a pair of skilled hands can be the difference between life and death. For Glenn Villeneuve, maintaining an independent lifestyle requires utilizing every hidden resource surrounding his camp. That's what I'm looking for. Nice, big grass leaves. As a wilderness purist, he still creates his fire by hand. I have to be really careful not to get the grass wet. It's pretty warm out, 12 degrees above zero, so if I get any snow on my hands or in my pocket, it starts melting right away, and the grass will get wet. And that is bad. Almost all the trees in this valley are white spruce, but the type I'm looking for Balsam poplar is a very different tree, and I know an area where there's a little grove of poplar trees. Rather than cutting a standing tree, I might be able to find a good piece of wood on the ground from a tree that fell over. I can see where some poplar trees here have died and fallen over underneath the snow. There, that's a piece of wood right there. This is the piece I want, this section in here. Because inside this piece of wood, there's a fireboard and a spindle. I just haven't found it yet. There. I just split off a piece that I think will work pretty good for the board. I've got my spindle. I'm gonna try and build a fire and cook some dinner right here. I'm just taking some of the grass and breaking it up. Go right here. 
right in the middle where the ember's gonna go. I've got an ember. It's just so beautiful to see that first ember when I'm drilling away like that. It's all dark, and then you see this little orange glow. But you don't want to stop too soon. You just keep going until you can't hold your breath anymore, because all the smoke's rolling up. You have to stop breathing at some point, and you just keep on trucking. There's just something special about these tools. It, they just feel great. I mean, just to think that you can just take a tree that's laying under the snow, and you can make a fire out of it. Think of all the people that have done this. For thousands and thousands of years, people have been building fires this way. They just stopped doing that recently. Most of the time people have been on Earth, this is how they've been building fires, you know? I live this way because I enjoy it. I could be laying in a hammock on the beach in Thailand if I wanted to be. But no, I, I just have a lot of fun up here. Trapping helps maintain a solitary, independent lifestyle. I'm trying to construct a box here to put a 330 cotton bear in. Something I've never done. I'm not that good of a carpenter, but I don't think the animals will notice. <laughs> to be paid so if i waste part of the trapping season fooling around with these cubby boxes and counter bears and i don't have any success that's time wasted fur i didn't catch and if i'm not catching fur i'm wasting money and i'm not into wasting anything up here i've made it up to the area i want to trap a nice fox track here i'm going to try to set up in this bank hopefully this will attract the fox to this area and we'll catch him and hope we have some luck use my handy trap setter here and Try not to break my arm. So I'm learning as I go, and whenever you're learning anything new, there's a learning curve. You gotta pay really close attention here. To make a mistake, cost you a finger or worse. So to be honest, I am kind of scared of these traps. I'm just not very experienced with them, so I try to use a lot of caution. I'm pretty cold right now. It's about 20 below zero. Oh! There's a learning curve. I'm just trying to have that curve not include me snapping my freaking arm in this. I try to use a lot of caution. Pretty cold right now. It's about 20 below zero. Oh, that wasn't cool. Oh, oh I caught my hand in it. Didn't feel particularly good. I guess that's part of the learning curve. I'm forced to work without a glove right now to get my glove out of the trap. It's not all that fun. Stupid like that where you are operating when you're tired. In the cold, doing stuff by yourself. You smash your hand open, you can get yourself in trouble out here, so... At least my arm's not stuck in it. Living in the 
independently in the Alaskan bush requires constant invention. Transforming raw materials into practical tools is critical to survival. In Norfolk, bartering is an essential part of village lifestyle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we're good now. Right on. <laughs> Let's take it to the back and you can check out the caribou meats. After trading caribou meat for an old oil drum, Chip is making a portable wood stove he can use for warmth in the brutally cold months ahead. There you go. It's really important that you be able to do it for yourself up here. There's no point in me trying to earn money to get myself a new stove when I could just make one. So right here I've got my doorway. something and you want it, you gotta make it yourself. Or do without. All the materials are coming right off this drum. I'm folding the edges of the door so nobody gets cut when we're using this thing and so that when it's in my sled and I pack stuff, it's not gonna slice my gear up. This is no place to do things half-assed. Nope. This piece I'm putting on right now let the door open and close. This is stiff enough. It'll stay up when you open the door. All right, more like that. Probably that way. Open up and close. Put your wood in. Over here you got a big enough area for a frying pan. Right there you got a big enough area for a coffee pot. Right there, go right up the stove. I think I got a drum with a piece of caribou. Now I have a stove. And what sets this stove apart from others is you live in a tent and you plan on being mobile. You don't want to carry the ash with you. You don't want to you want to make everything as light as possible. Possessions are a burden when you live out of a snow machine in a sled. First time we want to stoke it and make the whole thing really hot so we can get rid of any kind of stove oil or gasoline that may be still sitting inside the steel. It's kind of a way of cleaning it, cleaning it with fire. In Eagle. Winter is looming, and it's time for Andy to hunt bigger game. Store-bought food comes at a premium cost, but a buck fifty homemade bullet can bring him sixteen hundred pounds of meat. I should have waited a little longer. This moose is going to be a pain in the ass to get out. He's three feet in the water and thirty yards out into a slough, but uh, he's down. And that's good. So I'm gonna head on back and then try and get him out of here tomorrow. Hey, pumpkins! Dun, da, da, da. Andy got a moose last night, which is great. So Andy's just working on a an invention to get this going. I came up with the idea of building an Andy Boggin. So I found an old toboggan, welded up a couple of axles for it real quick, put some wheelbarrow wheels under it, and I'm gonna take a couple dogs down there and put them to work hauling this moose out for me. Let's go get a moose! Come on, Joe. Good girl. thing I want to see when we get there is a big old grizzly mowing down on our moose or a black bear. Andy and Kate are heading down river to pick up a kill, but there's a chance a predator made off with the remains. Last thing I want to see when we get there is a big old grizzly mowing down on our moose or a black bear. Straight ahead. Straight ahead. Good girl, Jack. Everything looks good this morning. Uh, looks like the ravens got into a little, but not bad. And uh, everything feels really cold. Hind quarters have probably the bulk of the big roasts and things like that. This is what your food's supposed to look like. <laughs> boys, let's go. Up, 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 up. Atta boys. We've got about a mile to uh, haul this.
first moose out. So the idea is the dogs do the work and I just have to walk along so I don't have to pack anything here. This is a pretty economical moose. He's costing me one bullet, a couple gallons of gas, and that's going to be protein and meat for us for a whole year. So the moose is in the boat. Dogs did their work, the Andy Boggin work, so it's been a good day. It's a long day, I'm pretty pooped, but the hardest part's over, getting them out, and all we have to do now is hang them up in the smokehouse, and we're set for the winter. Life in the Alaskan wilderness requires constant problem solving. Clever fixes and the ability to be resourceful are key to an independent lifestyle. For Eric, Living alone in the Alaskan bush means repairing essential items by any means necessary. Today we're going to change the stovepipe out. That's kind of beat down. A windstorm uh, damaged the old one, and I had to scab together uh, these pieces here uh, out of just some pipe I had laying around to get through. But it's it's a real fire hazard. It could easily burn my house down. This is going to be the piece that's right above the uh, stove itself. So we need to put a hole in the center of the pipe, and it's essential that the hole is centered and straight, and that's where our flue is going to go, our damper, and, and that's how you, you shut down the stove so that you can control the temperature in which it burns. My little way of uh, putting that hole in is with a 22 handgun. Got to make sure it's perfectly straight, and we're going to center it just right. Let's see how we did. Pretty good. Let's go put it in. Take the little pipe out. Try not to make a mess. Oh. Make a mess. We are north of the Arctic Circle, and it can get to 60 uh, below zero here. So staying warm and having a good wood stove is, is really important. It looks good. I'm happy with it. Light the virgin fire here. Appears to be drawing well. Get back to doing some other things. For Sue, living alone within a vast tundra means medical attention is hundreds of miles away. Creating her own means of staying healthy is essential to her survival. I have a way that I can take care of myself and kill some of the bacteria or viruses that may be trying to attack me. Bacteria cannot live in the presence of silver or gold particles. There's a thing called colloidal silver water that I want to make. And uh, electrical charge is going to allow molecules of this silver to come off of the strand and become suspended, so many parts per billion in the water. I take just the tiniest bit of sea salt. It's, uh, it's an electrolyte. It will help conduct the current better. You do not need much. Ten, fifteen dollars worth of silver is going to save me five, ten thousand dollars in flights and antibiotics if I want to fly and see the doctor. I can't afford to be down because I'm sick. It's arming myself on the inside. I put guns all around camp to keep me safe from the big creepy crawlies. I got to put little silver bullets in my body to take care of the tiny creepy crawlies. Bottoms up to my health. In Chandelar, Glenn's survival depends heavily on his ability to source fuel from his surroundings. Firewood is important out here. I spend a lot of time cutting wood all through the year. It's uh, one of the bigger jobs I have to do. I don't have any other source of heat other than a wood fire. I use it for heating hot water, and I have a fire going 24 hours a day through the winter. In the spring and in the summer, I still use a fire. I couldn't live out here without a fire. This looks like a good area to cut some trees. There are enough dead trees in close proximity that I can build a pile right here. This forest is all white spruce through here, and I only cut dead ones for firewood. And I've depleted all the dead trees within three or 400 yards of my camp, so I have to come quite a ways now to get wood. This look, looks like a good one to start on right here. A lot of people 
don't realize how much you can get done with a simple hand tool because they grew up in a world that was all mechanized and they never learned how to use tools like this or how to work like this. Oh, I broke my axe. I was out cutting wood tonight and I broke my axe handle. You just have to know how to fix it and you have to have a few tools. And you have to have a new handle, which I've got. I'm just gonna saw it off. Now I have to put a new handle on this head. I enjoy maintaining my own tools out here. When you're using a tool that you put together yourself, you know, you have a different relationship to it. You feel more connected to it than one that you bought that was already assembled. The nearest place where I can get any supplies is down at Fairbanks, a couple hundred miles south of here. So I have to plan carefully that I get everything I need because I sometimes stay out here for very long periods of time. I often ask people, what's the longest you've ever been without seeing anybody? And a lot of people tell me about 24 hours, <laughs> which I find interesting. This winter, I went four and a half months without seeing anybody. I'm not antisocial. I'm just anti-cultural. I don't care for the way of life down in modern society, so I choose to live out here. Okay, my axe is all ready to go. That's my favorite axe, and I got it all tuned up just the way I like it. I'm gonna go back out and chop some more wood. Deep in the Arctic, living independently requires knowledge. A keen understanding of your environment is essential to surviving alone. For Sue, years of experience on the tundra has helped her develop unique survival skills. With nothing but wilderness surrounding her home, keeping predators at bay is key to survival. I've got inside of my dwelling, going for protection-wise and security. Now I need to secure the exterior. With nothing but wilderness surrounding her home for many miles, Sue has to keep away the predators by any means necessary. Bears. All your predators, keen sense of smell. I use my leftover coffee grounds, get repurposed and sprinkled out. Even though there will be more snow, it is such a keen, strong odor that it is arming camp from the outside in. I've been doing this for years and years and years now, and over time, it is just sort of like you taking your morning coffee and eggs and bacon and going and sitting in a really ripe outhouse. Are you gonna go, mmm, this is the place I wanna eat? My concern is the bears, they are around. They've got, you know, well over 83 tag that have the possibility of walking right through my camp. They're up, they're looking for food, and I happen to be the only SOB that is cooking in a, in a huge radius. If you have an animal that is raging, charging, fixated, no, it's not going to stop them. But the ones that are ambling through going, yeah, hey, doesn't that chick live here? She'd make a tasty snack. They get close and go, whoa. It burns the heck out of their noses and it smells like a sewer. You know, no, I don't want to go there. The next thing I do is bleach. So with the bleach, put my thumb over. This is what I do. Everything. Get it a little bit heavy here. Now you can see this building here. All these marks are where I've had to repair it. Um, a bear came through here. That's a wolverine on the corner. So I just uh, try to deter it, try to keep that exposure to a minimum. I'm basically ready for winter to come knocking. If a few animals come knocking at the same time, I've got it covered. Two legged or four legged. This chick ain't going down easy. I'm ready. Norvik, Chip and Agnes use Inupac knowledge and traditional skills to create a sealskin vest. Goods created by hand can be used to barter or sell, helping maintain the Hellstone's independent lifestyle. Today I have uh, four different types of uh, skin scrapers. Me, I prefer this one. This was my mother's, and we call them Ichu, which means uh, skin scraper. When I was growing up, there was me and I had nine sisters, so we'd always be around our mom and she'd always have all different kinds of skins and we'd all sit down and we'd all learn how to do it. 
I'm gonna put all this in here. These are the shavings from the alder. And I'm gonna put them in the water to simmer. In order to preserve and tan the hide, a solution made of alder bark is used to dye the seal skin. At the end, before I do all my alder dyeing, I just sand it up and get all the rough stuff off. Hi, girls. Sweet pies. Why don't you come sit down and check out what your mom's up to? See all these fuzzies? That's all that needs to come off, and then we'll move on to dyeing it. For me, it's real important that the girls, all five girls, uh, get to know all the traditional things I do. Sometimes this environment is real harsh, and the more the girls get involved and hands-on, the more they'll know. I have the dye. Yay, it turned out good? It turned out like it should. Yeah, these are alders. Yep, those are the willows I use. I put these in, then I brought the water to a boil, and then I set it to simmer. You use this, and keep them back. I gotta see what I'm doing, though. You don't want to make it too wet, and you don't want to try to get the dye on this side. You just want to try to put it down over the top. There's all kinds of different things that they need to learn to survive and to pass down to their kids and try to keep it in our Inibak traditional manner. It's uh, something that you have to be involved in because it's always doing something. <laughs> it's living. Yeah, it's living. There you go. That's how you do it. If we don't teach our kids how to utilize the materials, the animals, and the other things around here to heat themselves, shelter themselves, clothe themselves, and make money, they're not going to survive very well. Looks like it's got an even coat all over, and you got the majority of the little pools picked up. Good job, girls. The girls did real good. Excellent job. For Andy, years of hunting have taught him to prepare for any situation. Having the tools he needs is critical if he is to harvest an elusive animal. Had a very early uh, snowfall this year, and it's really putting a hurt on the way we do things. Everything's frozen down, everything's buried under the snow. I would have liked to have harvested a little bit more meat. Uh, we got a nice moose, but uh, today what's on the agenda is to go get uh, a couple beavers. There's a couple beaver ponds not too far from here, and the season's open for firearm. Once it cools off a little bit more with the snow, we'll get a lot of ice forming on the Yukon pretty quick. So I want to take full advantage of being able to use the boats before winter sets in completely. Hunting beaver is a little bit different than hunting a lot of uh, hooved animals. Beavers have a pretty good sense of smell. They tend, tend to come out in the early mornings and late evenings. So. Uh, I don't know if he'll be out right now, but this is close enough to home. I can always come back in the evening time if I need to. It's a beaver, too. It's a lot of aspen and a lot of cottonwood right here, so this is what they prefer to eat. You can see there's quite a few chews around here. So far, I've never lost a beaver hunting them this way. I don't want this to be the first. I'm gonna see if I can't cast out a few times and hopefully snag them. I'll probably end up snagging a damn branch. There's an awful lot of stuff in the river. Stay on losing game when I shoot it. Just try to 
drives me nuts. It sucks. Fishing for beavers. That's the first. Ooh, there's some bubbles coming up right there. This is like a one in a million chance. Traditional Inupak villages, women are in charge of the fishing. That's what needs to be done. Go hold it's time. crucial that Agnes's daughters learn the skill if they are to survive this way of life. Stop it. Watch where you're going. Watch where you're going. You gotta make it real tight so the anchor will hook when I let it go. Straight there. And when you let go of your anchor, you make sure your anchor's like this and not gonna get caught with nothing and let it go. Oh yeah. Watch it sink. Farmer Diddy. If we make sure our net is set perfectly, we'll have more advantage and more fish. Stop already, bun. Stop. Turn it off. Just turn it completely off. Should I pull up my motor? Yes. Watch out for that lever. That's why we need you to drive. You're strong enough to pull it up. Here, no, give me that. Oh, and make sure it's not tangled to the bottom. Oh, I feel something. It's Wait. a white fish. Yeah. Oh, two of them. Three of them. Pike. Whoa. Definitely gonna need a real big fish rack. <laughs> it's real important for me to teach my girls all the stuff that I know or what I've learned from my parents or my aunts or my brothers and sisters. If they don't get it from someplace like me or my husband, um, they could lose it, but we're not gonna let that happen. In the Alaskan bush, Learning to create and innovate is the only hope against the vast and desolate landscape. Extreme isolation brings unique challenges, but the reward is a life of independence. There's very few places left in the world where you can go and live and carve out a, a life for yourself and do it on your own terms, and that's why I live here. Having the ability to wake up every morning and decide what I want to do that day, it's a very satisfying way of living. 